Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, January 10, 2019 special meeting of the school committee and public hearing. I would ask all those in attendance to please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So we're going to begin this evening's meeting uh, before we get to the public hearing with the recognitions for um, Emma McNamara, if you want to come up, and Dr. Kavanaugh, I'll let you uh, okay. do the introduction. So. Over here. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Yes, yes, please. Thank you so much for coming in. This is always exciting for us to have somebody as accomplished as you come in to see us and to see some of what's going on in the district. So thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Emma, and welcome. So uh, Emma McNamara has had an article published in Tech Directions magazine. We learned about this from your teacher, Mr. Scott. Um, and as I was reading this, I was amazed at what a fantastic writer you are, which brought us to the question of journalist or scientist. Right. So I guess I would just ask you to tell us a little bit about how all of this came about for you. So nonfiction is kind of outside of my comfort zone. I'm normally a creative writer. I got an email from Mr. Scott asking if I wanted an opportunity to be published in a national magazine. And there was no other context, so I was just very confused. But um, then he gave me more information. And I found out I had to, like, interview people as a part of it and interview um, firefighters and students and that's also out of my comfort zone because normally for creative writing I just write alone in my room but I decided to try it and I'm really glad I did. Okay, so tell us a little bit about the, the projects that happened in Mr. Scott's classroom. So the projects are, um, it's been every year for I think three years or four years now um, the students work with the first responders who give them um, problems that they have and they have to, the students also come up with some more possible problems and they have to create something that will be a possible solution and they go through many fabrications and different models and then they have the firemen come in again and show them and they sort of like rank the projects. I think one of the things that I found interesting is as I was reading and I kept thinking, oh my gosh, this, this process of sort of revision is something that's transferable, not just from an engineering classroom, but it's the kind of thing that I think we do in sort of science and we do it in English. And um, then as I kept reading, that's exactly what Mr. Scott tells us in his quote, doesn't he? Um, I also very much liked that he kind of takes sort of project-based learning to the next level and talks about problem-based learning. Are you actually enrolled in this class, or did he just find you as a writer? I was in this class um, sophomore year, but not this year. I'm just a writer now. <laughs> that is great. Well, this is an amazing article. Um, and I don't know if any of the committee members want to add to make a comment. Uh, uh, I have a question for you, Emma. It, it was fantastic writing. Um, you talked a little bit about your comfort zone and being outside your comfort zone. How did you overcome that? You know, you, you talked about both in the writing style as well as interviewing people. Yeah, for me, um, the interviewing part was especially difficult because I have social anxiety, so interviewing especially like these important people was kind of difficult. But my dad's a journalist, so he he's taught me a lot about it. And it's just I knew that I would regret it if I didn't go for it. Well, that's a fantastic point. Uh, you know, just today I was um, at the homework center in Framingham, and the lady who runs it was talking about comfort zone. She herself is a very shy person, but she has to interact with people all the time. And she said, we don't have those choices um, to be in our comfort zone. Only when we step out of that is when we truly grow. So I'm glad you did that and you experienced this. And congratulations. Thank you. This is a huge, huge achievement. And I hope you continue to step outside your comfort zone in the future, too. Thank you. 
Yeah, that was the thing you said most often. That was so. I was kind of laughing over here, and you're like, "Well, that was outside of my comfort zone," and then that was also okay. <laughs> you just, I'm like, "This is a tough one." They threw this at you, and yeah. you rallied, and you did an amazing job. So, congratulations! Thank you. I'm sure your journalist father is very proud of you for what you accomplished. So, congratulations. Good job. Thanks. Very well done. I echo what everybody has said, and just this is such a big accomplishment particularly for somebody still in high school, I think to be in a publication like this is an exciting thing for an adult, but to have that before you've even gone off to college, congratulations and a fantastic job. It really, uh, I never would have guessed it was out of your comfort zone. <laughs> yeah, I'll echo that. I honestly thought that this was the kind of writing you always did. I would never have known that this was sort of your first foray into journalism because it's beautiful. Thank you. Congratulations. And all the best for the future. Yep. Thank you. Yes, thank you for coming in on such short notice, too. Uh, that, yeah, thanks for having me. Oh, that's <laughs> wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, at this point, I would like to have a motion to enter into our public hearing. So moved. And a second? Second. So, motion by Jen, second by Mina. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And so we Aye. will now open the public hearing, and I think we'd like to start that out with uh, Dr. Kavanaugh, but we will invite, after Dr. Kavanaugh speaks for a couple minutes, anybody who would like to come up and ask questions or make comments to come up and please sit and just state your name for the record, but we would love to hear from all of you. So, Yes, so I won't go through the entire budget presentation that we did last week, uh, but I did want to point out something on this slide right here. So... You can see what we added in FY19 and what we took away in FY19, what we added in FY20 and what we took away in FY20. Um, you'll recall that when Mr. Bishop made his budget presentation, he had advocated to get another guidance counselor at the high school level. Um, since that time, he's been doing sort of a little bit of rethinking, and his feeling is that at least for the next year, he's going to be able to make things work without adding a guidance counselor at the high school level. So you don't see that there added, and you don't see anything taken away because it was never added and sort of never taken away. So I just wanted to clarify that. Are there, do we have copies of the slide presentation for if anybody needs those? Hard copies? Hard copies, no. I don't have hard okay. copies with me. Okay. If okay. anybody either at home or here wants to follow along if you have a device, the slide presentation from last week is available on our district website. If you go to the school committee tab, you can click on budget and it will the budget presentation will pop up. So I would like to invite if there is anybody that would like to come up and ask questions or uh, make any comments to please come up and you can sit right up here. So. Praveena Teneti, 36 Huckleberry Road. Um, I'm a member of ALPAC, Advanced Learners Parent Advisory Council. And my question is behalf of my kid and other kids who are not currently challenged in the classroom. I'm glad to see that there are positions for um, K-5 to and a math and literacy coach for differentiation. My question is how much of their job is for differentiation? And what do you see as the biggest challenges right now for differentiation? I'll let and, me answer this too. Um, I think one of the things that we need to think very hard about is um, when we create either new programs or new curricula, um, one of the things that is critical to making it work and making it work across all classrooms at a grade level is to ensure that teachers have an understanding of what the curriculum looks like, they get whatever training is necessary, we are able to put materials into place. And so I would say that those would be, in fact, the challenges. Um, later this evening, I will be presenting an entry findings report. And in the entry findings report, you'll sort of see that you know, as I have gone through the district and asked people um, during a listening tour or in sort of a gathering see and hear data uh, what it is that they think is important, there are people who are looking for differentiation, advanced learning, experiential learning, project-based learning, problem-based learning, a STEAM program, 
um, connections with community colleges, internships, and I only mention that to sort of show the enormity of the kinds of programs that people would like in the district. So as we move forward and we start to think about what a new three-year strategy is going to look like, I think we need to think about as a district what are the important, sort of those big rocks, the, the important things to drive the instruction over the next three years. And I don't know if you want to add to that as our... Sure. I know you, you requested a position too, so. Yes, and I think um, the term differentiation is one that I hear in nearly every meeting that I attend that's based in curriculum. So um, when we work with teachers, I think to Carol's point, when we're looking at new curriculum, we're focused on teachers really understanding what the standards are, what it is that they need to roll out, and what students need to know and be able to do by the end of a particular unit. But as teachers become more embedded in the curriculum and more familiar with that, we're working, um, I would say, very carefully. So I'll give you social studies as an example. The curriculum is changing, and in all the curriculum documents that we're producing, differentiation is a category in the curriculum documents. So as teachers are creating and becoming more adept at what the expectations are, they're also digging in to figure out what are we going to do for our advanced learners, what are we going to do for our struggling learners, um, and that's true in all content areas. So, you know, I can't tell you that I think we're there and every lesson is differentiated in the way that we would like at this point in time. Um, in every area from literacy <clears throat> through the content areas, that is a focus of our work and teachers are keenly aware of that. Um, in some cases, it's simply the challenge of locating resources, uh, understanding the needs of your students and making sure the resources match the needs uh, and the challenges in the classroom. And I think that, you know, the project-based learning, problem-based learning, all of those work really well with differentiation too, right? They, they do work well together. Yes. So thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to come up to, to speak? Okay. So the next steps then uh, in the budget is we will bring this back again next week. We are certainly still, if people want to reach us for feedback by email, we certainly welcome that. Uh, and we will take this up again next week so that we can vote the A budget and submit it to the town manager's office uh, following that so we can go through the town process before it gets to uh, annual town meeting in May for a town-wide vote. So at this point, if there are no more comments on the, for the public hearing, I would seek a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Are we all those in favor? Yes. Okay. So the public hearing is now closed, although certainly we are um, continuing to take feedback all the way up until and beyond when we vote the budget next week. So at this point, uh, do we have a uh, student council report? Welcome. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is William Dion. And yes, I'm here on behalf of the uh, Hopkins High School Student Council. Um, so not a whole ton um, happening right now, sort of um, after the break. Um, however, we are preparing for the uh, midterms. Um, so those are coming up um, from the January 22nd to the 25th. Um, and following that is a homework-free weekend. Um, and second semester starts on January 28th. Um, and with that, um, each class will be having a, a meeting, um, sort of about upcoming events um, and all that. Um, additionally, um, the principal, uh, Mr. Evan Bishop, our um, Hopkins High School's principal, um, sent out a school climate survey. Um, and so um, he sent it out to all of his students, um, sort of to f seek feedback upon the school environment um, and what he can do better as a principal. Uh, so we will be seeing results for that soon, um, and hopefully I can bring those um, to you at a later date. Um, additionally, sports, um, our winter sports teams are doing pretty well. Um, so the track team is looking strong, and I know girls basketball is playing games tonight, um, and boys basketball is playing um, tomorrow night. Um, additionally, um, we have an upcoming robotics competition on January 20th. Um, also, the student council um, is running uh, putting for patience on March 8th, so I know it's um, it's a bit far out, but we just wanted to um, let everyone know that it is an event run by the Jimmy Fund. Um, it's a mini golf event in the high school gym, 
Um, and it's open to the, um, not just high school students, but everyone. Um, and it, of course, it's for a good cause. So um, keep an eye out on social media uh, for more updates uh, to follow. Um, additionally, um, MLK Day will be coming up on January 21st, um, so a day of service. And also, um, something pretty cool that um, some teachers got to take part in um, recently was that nine teachers shadowed students, um, sort of to get a perspective from the student's point of view, um, how it, the school day works for the student. Um, they brought their, um, their observations and their findings to the staff meeting, um, just to get a better sense of what the student life is like. Um, and that's all we have. So thank you for having me. Thank you for coming in. I know it's always a busy time of yeah. year, but uh, I, I know midterms is weighing on everybody's yeah. mind coming yeah. up. So yeah. good luck with those. Thank you. Thank I have you. a question for yeah. you, yeah, if that's OK. You talked about teachers shadowing students. I think that's a fantastic thought. Yeah. Um, how did that go? Were students themselves, or were you? Um, were yeah, you so I actually got the opportunity of being shadowed uh, by Mr. Brian Prescott, okay. um, a freshman history teacher. And it was actually a very cool experience. Um, so at first I was a little hesitant just because um, I didn't really know what that would um, look like or sort of feel like, um, but when I actually did it, I decided, um, I decided to let him do it and then uh, it was really cool. I mean, especially because Mr. Prescott, um, for those of you who don't know, was a student here once, um, 10 or 12 years ago. So he said it was a little strange seeing some of his teachers again uh, in the classroom, <laughs> but, um, but I don't know. We had some interesting conversations about um, how teachers see things and sort of how students see things. Um, and hopefully we can um, continue to work together to make a better school environment. Fantastic. Yeah. Congratulations yeah. on uh, you know, the whole process yeah. and whoever came up with this Thanks. idea and uh, you know, Mr. Bishop's leadership, of yeah. course, who continues to promote this culture of you know, being better yeah. all the time. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you again. Thanks, thank you. I'm going to take uh, new business A out of order here. Of course. Would you, Chief, Chief Lee, Chief Slamman, if you guys would like to come up, we'll take you out of order, unless you have a burning desire to sit through the, the next parts. <laughs> you are special. And we, we appreciate having you guys come in to explain all this to us. So this is great. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Hello. So um, I will uh, just introduce uh, Chief Slayman and Chief uh, Lee. I recently met with them and the tech person on the town side, as well as with Mr. Ghosh, who is our technology director. And the subject of our conversation really was giving emergency personnel access to the cameras inside our public schools. Um, and we talked an awful lot about the situation under which we would have access to the cameras in our schools, and um, those are outlined in the agenda for tonight, and I will let you talk a little bit about it because you know a lot more about that than I do. I think just uh, I'm going to turn it to my security expert here in a second, but just for um, emergency management's sake, um, we're constantly reaching out to see what uh, collaborations we can work on to uh, community preparedness has been a big echo in the last couple of years. Um, we've done quite a bit through Marathon where we will learn a lot about technology and security and where we can kind of use force multipliers because our limited resources and what we can get the most out of them. So against that background of my security expert <coughs> helps me realize how we can uh, get some improvements and uh, I'll let Chief Lee take over from there. Thank you. Um, you know, let, let me start by saying that uh, working with uh, Dr. Kavanaugh, the new leadership with the, uh, the schools, uh, I think I speak for both uh, the chief and myself, that we have a great working relationship and uh, we couldn't be happier uh, working with her and uh, lo looking forward to uh, the future. And we, we make a good team. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Having that been said, I just want to say uh, the technology has been there in the school for some time now. Um, the school's IT department has done a, a, an un unbelievable job of uh, setting up these cameras and also uh, being able to feed the, the cameras into what we call public safety dispatch. Now that pu public safety dispatch uh, is for both police and fire. And we have several monitors inside the uh, station 
and um, you know the goal is not to be monitoring the school quite frankly we wouldn't be able to do that with just two dispatches because we also have cameras for other town buildings as well the goal is if there's an incident uh, God forbid uh, an active shooter we get a call from the school uh, you know or outside the school our immediate uh, goal is to identify where that threat is and if we can pinpoint that through communication from the school uh, we get a great systems in, in place now but the video would en enhance that if we were able to track the movements of a suspect uh, inside the building and as we say uh, direct the threat towards them and uh, take out the, that threat um, it, it's you know it's something that um, if that technology is there you know why not utilize that I, I and I quite frankly if uh, there was an incident and uh, we didn't utilize that technology then there'd probably be a lot of a lot of questions asked um, I know there might be some sensitivity to, to the cameras and like I said that it only be monitored in an emergency situation or a call for uh, a suspicious person things of things of that nature um, uh, alarms at night so we're try, uh, trying to uh, break into the uh, the schools uh, you know we just want to be um, prepared uh, as much as possible um, public safety dispatch uh, they are highly trained um, they see sensitive information all the time all day long like police officers and they've all uh, have, have much training on that and the confidentiality agreements uh, things uh, things of that sort uh, we've also developed the policies within the uh, uh, police department as far as uh, monitoring information uh, kind of giving information out uh, who should have access to certain things and uh, that will certainly uh, be in play and we would have the technology to to uh, determine if someone was looking you know, out of school <laughs> when they weren't supposed to so it's a professional uh, a system and, and I can sure that uh, we certainly would have uh, uh, the pieces in place to make sure that, that the system is only used for what it is intended for which is a an emergency um, a situation um, to pinpoint that threat and uh, save lives if, if it ever comes to something like that someday so with that I'll take any questions you may have oh, the chief I don't have any questions, but I did, did want to make a couple of comments. One is uh, we are so fortunate to have both of you and your departments in town. I, it's hard to imagine a town that has better public safety and first responders in town. But it, this is, seems like it, there's really no downside to this, that the cameras I know don't point to anything that's not really a public area anyway. Yes. And I know that it's not being used in any way that it's, it's not like we're trying to catch students at anything, but it's to protect our students, our teachers, and our building and everything here and like you said god forbid something bad ever did happen uh, to have the ability to get your people in the right place is a huge uh, huge bonus and shame on us if we didn't try to enhance as much as we can to keep our students safe so that was my comment i don't know if people have questions um, one of the comments i know last year you um, helped host a public safety forum for the town and um it was just really impactful to hear all the work that you guys do all the time and to know that you're sort of out in front looking for new opportunities to keep our, our staff safe our students safe it really makes a difference and i just want to thank you I think this is something as nancy said that the cameras are already there and if you can leverage that technology to be more effective in what you do to minimize threats i think it's a win for us so thank you well, that was a great event I personally appreciate that uh, you two also are very approachable. Um, I think that's very important part of, uh, you know, people feeling comfortable coming up with any concerns or what have you. So if any parents have any questions and whatnot about, uh, you know, what this might entail, who is the best person to reach out? I know people have had the chance to look at the agenda ahead of time. Uh, I don't know if we have received any questions or comments, but if um, anyone or even students were curious, what does that mean to me now that the police can actually view it, but only under certain conditions, yes. correct? So who should they reach out to? Well, I think because they're school personnel, they can certainly reach out to me. Okay. That Great. would be fine. Thank you. But if anybody from the public has any questions about our 
public safety dispatch we uh on a daily basis give give tours of the uh the facility and uh we have a lot of students that come through the uh, the building and uh you know they they enjoy uh the uh, the, the public safety uh dispatch probably second to the cell block <laughs> <laughs> Although That's you funny. can't compete with the fire trucks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, but I'm, I'm fully in support of the proposal made here. I, I think it's in the right direction. There's yes. no doubt. When we realized this was an opportunity, I mean, we spent so much time, money, effort, resources on the cameras that it's just really appropriate to use them to, you know, their maximum potential. So I think this made really great sense. Um, so when, when we realized that this was a possibility, we immediately organized a meeting and got everything into place because it's really important to keep our kids safe every day. Dr. Kavanaugh, presumably on a, on a some regular basis, annually or biannually, you would receive a report or work together to see the number of times they've been utilized, if at all? So Josh Grissetti is the person on the town side who runs the technology, and um, he had said that he can run a report any time to see you know, when they're utilized and why. And just to reinforce the point, because I think in conversations this came up one more time, this isn't to, to keep an eye on the students. It's Absolutely not in any not. way just to see what's going on. It's not, you know, monitoring what's going on with the kids. This is only if there's a situation that we need to bring in. And in fact, the public it, safety it, officers, whatever, you know. A, a good example. And in fact, say there was like a, uh, a fight in the hallway, an assault between students. Um, we wouldn't uh, we wouldn't access those cameras we would do it like we normally do with any investigation and obtain a, a warrant to get the information to keep it above board right right just to kind of put everybody's yeah. concerns about that to yes. rest right it's not to watch the kids this is for emergency situations Absolutely. and it makes sense we need it in an emergency situation we're trying to work in other areas of the community with uh, private businesses out in 495 there's cameras and again we wouldn't monitor them at all but when there's an emergency if we have the ability to access something to get earlier awareness then we send appropriate resources and it gives a calming effect to a lot of people just that that's happening out there right. so we're, I hope with technology and security improving that this will actually get broader as we go through the years I would guess maybe it's a deterrent um, from potentially bad things happening in the school if people know that the you guys are able to access into our video feed. It can give you a deterrent effect and it can give you a calming effect yes, hopefully. Right, it can right. actually make you feel more secure. Mm -hmm. so, I'm just gonna I want to read the consideration for the camera so people at home who are not following along can be aware before we vote what we're voting on that the, for consideration is to enhance situational awareness the superintendent recommends the school committee move to grant the Hopkinton Police Department and Hopkinton Fire Department access to exterior and interior cameras during times of suspicious activity, the sounding of any alarm, or endangerment to students and or school personnel. The intent is to use technology to aid the call for service. Discretion as to when to monitor the cameras lies with the Hopkinton public safety officials and any additional first responders. So I would seek a motion to approve this agreement between the Hopkinton Police Department, Hopkinton Fire Department, and Hopkinton Public Schools relating to the use of exterior and interior cameras in the school buildings. So moved. Motion by Mina. Second. Second. Second by Jen. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. Yes. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, um, thank really thank you very much. Us. Yes. And thank it. you for the work. It's been great. Thanks. And thank you, Dr. Kavner. Yeah. That collaboration is so important for all of all of us. So thank you. I guess uh, we'll backtrack a little bit back to the rest of our reports and we can move into uh, your report. Okay. okay. So my report this evening um, is on my formative evaluation. As you know, in the state of Massachusetts, the superintendent's evaluation is public. Um, halfway through a superintendent's first year, you do go through the formative evaluation process. Um, and I just, I'm not sure that everyone understands what that looks like, so I have a couple of slides here just to describe it. Um, in the state of Massachusetts, there's a rubric by which superintendents are evaluated. And it's kind of important, I think, to understand that the rubric is made up of standards. So that's what you see in the blue boxes across the top. 
under each standard, th standard, there is a variety of indicators. So the, you see the first one there that says A, curriculum indicator, but there would obviously be B, C, D, E as you go down standard one. And then these smaller numbers here are the ones that we call elements. When you actually look at the rubric, and a rubric is only a rubric if there are gradations. So what you see there is that very first element. This is 1A1. And it really talks about designing lessons for students. And so you can see that the rankings go from unsatisfactory to exemplary. Um, and the language that you see under each one of those um, categories are actually called descriptors. So a proficient descriptor for somebody in the 1A1 standard space unit design is someone who provides support and assistance for administrators to learn and employ effective strategies for ensuring that educators and educator teams design standards-based unit with measurable outcomes and challenging tasks requiring higher order thinking, frequently monitors and assesses progress, providing feedback as necessary. So that is one, one single descriptor for one single element. So you may be wondering how many of those there are. Uh, there are four standards, as you could see. Overall, there are 20 indicators and there are 42 elements by which superintendents are evaluated. Um, then, the second part of the superintendent's evaluation is that there are goals. And what is required is that a superintendent propose at least four goals for the upcoming year. Two to four of them should be district improvement goals. One should be a student learning goal and one should be a professional practice goal. So, um, I will give you the materials I brought. There's one for Meg Tyler there, too. So. Okay. What you want to do that one? Oh, it's the whole packet. Whole packet. <laughs> Everyone gets one. Yeah. I feel Thanks you. Thanks for having I feel you. <laughs> Jen's already making fun. I know. I know. Okay. <laughs> I'm not making fun. <laughs> Definitely not. So what I've done with this packet uh, is I have included a few things. The very first thing that you see on top are the five goals that I had established back in August and that you had approved then. The second document is your own copy of the Massachusetts model system for educator evaluation. The third part of this, and you can read this at your leisure, is where I sort of go through and take a look at um, those element, elements and I pretty much do it at the indicator level so that you can sort of see where I assess the district to be at this point in time. And then the last thing where we'll spend a little bit of time is my entry findings report. So let's start by going through the goals update. Uh, Dr. Kim, if you don't mind helping, um, all, you know, everyone as to why we are doing it right now. Oh, I see. Sure. So what happens is when you are in your first three years, whether you're a teacher, an administrator, or a superintendent, you have sort of single year evaluations. And so halfway through your first year, you have a formative evaluation. And so January sort of being a mid-mark for us, um, you know, as our uh, student council friend just told us that we'll be switching in the semester in January. So this really is sort of a, a mid-mark for us in the school year, which makes it an appropriate time to present uh, the formative assessment data. So this is my, oops, I'm not sure why we're on goal four. I apologize. Dr. Kavanaugh. Yes. Is this informative tonight? There, is there, there's no action on our part tonight other than No to action. Absorb. Correct. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I'm just delivering information. In fact, uh, closer to the end, I was going to suggest that after I go through this, you just take it and digest it. Uh, we had agenda planning today and we suggested that maybe you could offer me feedback publicly when we come back uh, in the first meeting in February. And that gives you three weeks to take any of this. If there's anything that I present that you have questions about or if there's any sort of evidence or information that you would like to stop into central office or that I could email to you, I'm happy to do that. All right, so the first goal is a district improvement goal. And the district improvement goal is the one where I am doing the work around creating a new three-year district strategy. So to just sort of let you know where I am right now, in the entry findings report, you're going to see that most of the data that uh, I had promised to analyze will be there. Uh, 
Number two, by October 31st, I would conduct a listening tour. I think it actually took me a little bit longer than October 31st. But I have met with all of those groups except for the ones who are yellow highlighted. I mean, some of the reasons why I didn't meet with the yellow highlighted people are just we don't have an LPAC. Um, for whatever reason, we just didn't connect with the HPTA. So, um, But all of the other ones I did, in fact, meet with, and maybe even a couple more that were not originally listed. Uh, by December 31st, observe classrooms throughout the district and interact with faculty, collecting hear and see data. And I have done that uh, both formally and informally, I think, over the last few years. And by January 31st, establish focus groups whose mission it is to use findings to write portions of the strategic plan. Um, this date may need to be pushed out a little bit. I have um, contracted with one of the DESI consultants who comes out to do strategic planning with districts, and so she's going to run, formally run the focus groups in the district for us, and I think that that's probably um, one of the smarter things to do because then you don't let your subjectivity kind of cloud things. Uh, Dr. Kavanaugh, I know that you, you've had, you know, every day is so busy and packed for you, and it's budget season, first budget season for you, too. Um, the ones highlighted in yellow, do you plan to meet them in the near future? We did meet with the HPTA, but I think that they were interested in HPA doings, you know, sort of the business of the HPTA. Okay. If there is an LPAC, I would be happy to meet with the LPAC. Um, and I would also be happy to reach out to any cultural alliances. Just to be the LPAC is English language learners? Yes. Perfect. The state now tells us that we have to form an LPAC, and it's English learn learner parent um, advisory group. We do not have one in place yet. Uh, so one of the things that I am thinking is the January 31st, we may have focus groups in place, um, but we will probably not actually have those focus groups happen until we get closer to you know February or March. Um, and just in communication with the consultant, we had talked a lot about um, having the district admin team do some of the work uh, ahead of time to just sort of frame know some of the topics that we would want focus groups to surround uh, Tuesday on the 8th of January I did have um, an admin council meeting where we spent a lot of time thinking about what are the really important things in our district right now are things like curriculum instruction communication budget finance all of those things and we I think we've had some very good uh, communication around that So the second one is a professional practice goal. Uh, this is the culture and diversity work that we started to do way back in August. And so you will recall in August we had conducted a survey. We in surveyed parents, students, faculty, and alumni to sort of think about the professional learning that we would be doing throughout the year. In August, we were able to meet with a consultant, Khalees Wernham, who um, was planning to be with us also on November 13th, January 8th, and March 12th. She has been unable to fulfill her obligations um, to us, and so she is no longer working with the district. Um, we are still doing all of the work that we started in ADL, and Jen and I are actually going to a culture and diversity uh, full day on a Saturday coming up. Um, and, you know, I, uh, continuing to address issues, concerns, reading, TED Talks, all of those things in um, our admin council meetings. Typically what happens in an admin council meeting is that we will spend a little bit of our time uh, looking at culture and diversity. We are still doing our book studies with everyday anti-racism and um, culturally responsive teaching in the brain. We've added some other things along the way to that. Uh, you know, New York Times articles, TED Talks, that kind of thing. But it's been generating some, I think, excellent dialogue. And I think that we have been thinking very hard about uh, what it means to, you know, sort of be really culturally proficient. Um, and that was the work that Khalees had started with us in, in August. What does cultural proficiency look like? Uh, I do have some samples of things that I can either send to you uh, down the table or I can, you know, hang on to those and... Um, I can share them in other ways, just in case you don't want to take up too much time with all of that tonight. Um, 
And then, as you know, one of the things that, that doesn't appear in this document is the culture and diversity forums, and we have done two of those. I think that those uh, were December 13th and maybe September 30th. Dr. Kavner, what's the best way to ask you for the questions as, as you shared this? Oh, if you want to ask right now, that would be perfect. Okay. Um, so you, in the key process benchmarks number five, you haven't given any update for some reason. Are we on uh, the goal to building the repertoires of admin faculty and staff? Key benchmarks number five. Yes. Goal number two. Goal number two, key process benchmarks point number five. Communicate with survey respondents who have reached out to me for follow. Yes. Oh, yes. You know what? I probably should have said that. That's sort of how I found some of the people for the panel um, when we did the culture and diversity forum. Um, you know, one thing um, that has uh, that stuck with me of the talks that came up at the diversity forum that you had had the second one. It's not out of my mind. The speaker took such a wonderful analogy. He talked about uh, this work being like dental hygiene, that you oh, have to take TikTok. care of it every yes. day. Yes. You have to attend to it. And um, so I think those, those things are powerful. Um, so how, how can we figure out what's the best way to measure? You know, we, we do see teachers and we do see administrators being there and especially the second forum I thought hearing the students speak and the teachers and it was a very good participation I thought. So how do we measure that there is a true change? One of the things that um, that I think I've done is conduct surveys with the admin team. Mm -hmm. I don't actually do it with all of the teachers because I feel like that's that sort of next layer down. I, my interaction is predominantly with the administrative team. And, you know, I mean, I guess we could conduct surveys around like the ADL, but it, I think that this is one of those things that's very hard to measure because, you know, it's the way sort of people behave and people feel. And sometimes I think that people, you know, when we did the second culture and diversity forum, we said we always have to consider that people are coming from a place of good intentions. And I think that that's, that's how people approach things. And sometimes unwittingly, we say things or we do things that have an adverse effect on the listener, right? right. But we're unaware that we're doing that. Exactly. Um, on the full PD day, at the high school, they had um, an, an ed camp sort of format and one of the ed camp sessions was about culture and diversity and the room was pretty packed there are quite a few high school teachers that and I think middle school teachers who attended that and what was lovely in that session is that you could sort of see that there was um, I think varying levels of proficiency some people wanted more some people felt very confident to speak so for me, it's hard to measure because I think some people would even respond in ways that are confident even if they don't necessarily have uh, the proficiency that they assume that they have. Some people may not respond with that kind of confidence even though they have markedly um, high proficiency. Do you know what I mean? Right. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering when would be an appropriate time to have a follow-up survey and would that be a decent measure? Um, I don't know, just throwing it out there, like, I know we just had it, right? And you, you've just, not that this work hasn't been happening, but you have made it a priority, mm -hmm. right? And it takes time to see change of this nature. So when would be an appropriate time to measure from that perspective, perhaps? Do you mean a district-wide survey? Right. Well, I would say that I'm a little reluctant to do that in that one of the things that when we started the work, we had agreed that it was really about informing the work for administrators to sort of identify, you know, were there their voices where people were expressing that 
you know, they had some difficulty. And so was it a problem big enough to warrant the kind of work that we're doing? But we had also agreed, I thought, that um, this was not necessarily sort of scientific embedded in quantitative data. So to put it out there again, I'm not sure that we're going to sort of see the growth that we want in a scientific kind of way. Right, right. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm uh, you know, again, just throwing it out there that typically surveys could, you know, but if you have to standardize. I think the first one you said was simply a test and kind of get the measure and kind of be even aware that these issues exist and kind of open the box if, mm -hmm. a little bit. So I, I just want you to think about this a little bit, that if you were to standardize a survey, the language, and whether with the help of, uh, you know, professional or what have you, could that be used as a measure? Uh, because ultimately, how do we know that the change has, is happening and is impacting all the pain that we heard in the surveys? We have to make that, we have to lessen that, right? We, we have to move in that right direction. Um, yeah, maybe I will sort of share something with you. Um, so the... One of the things that I have just shared with the administrators recently, um, I have a friend who is Serbian. He and his wife are both Serbian, and he's a professor at Holy Cross. Um, a lot of the work that he does, he started out as a philosopher, but for the last several years he's been doing peace studies, and he travels to India very frequently um, and, and works there. Uh, so he had put together a, a collection. It was just journal entries that were sort of his recollections or, you know, of, of his last trip through uh, India. And when I got to the epilogue of his book, I thought, this is exactly the kind of thing that I would like for our administrators to think about as, um, as we're doing this kind of diversity work. So I'm just going to read for you uh, that last little part of his epilogue, because to me, this is the, of what the work is about, right? I, I don't know that I want to measure it so much as I want to just kind of keep it in the forefront of everybody's daily life. Anyway, my friend, whose name is Predrag Chikovatsky, says, uh, oh, so I should contextualize this for you. He was giving a speech um, or a talk in, in India in a, a college that he said was in probably a very rural area, and it was, you know, a group of people who were probably not very affluent. He had done a series of these talks, and he said this one, and it was sort of magical for him because he kind of likes to be in those places where people are eager to learn and don't have um, the kind of affluence or that sort of scholarly way about them. Um, so at the end, somebody asks him uh, about mystical experiences, and he says, I continued after another pause, I do not co consider an experience in which I lose myself a mystical one. Quite the contrary for me, a mystical experience is the one in which I find myself as a human being and come closer to confronting the real. And I find myself most when I have a genuine encounter with another human being. The fact that you and I, of different ages, cultures, religions, skin colors, and personal experiences, the fact that the two of us can have this sincere and engaged dialogue, this for me is a miracle, a mystical experience. Us being here together, listening, and trying to learn from each other, this is what truly matters. And we listen the best and learn the most in the presence of those who are different than we are. This is what calls for the affirmation of reality, for the reverential attitude toward this mysterious gift of being alive and enhancing our humanity. So that is uh, one of the things that I have recently shared with uh, the admin team. And I mean, I read that, I get goosebumpy about it because I do think that that's the real work, right? It's not the kind of thing that, you know, I guess surveys dictate or it's just bringing people together and sharing humanity. And I think we have to get more comfortable in our own skin doing that. You know, I don't it's know. very well written. Yeah. yeah. Thank you oh, for sharing. He's really smart. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I think, you know, so when we did the first survey, there were angry voices and you could hear them, right? But you don't have a face associated with that. And you worry about the lines on that screen and are those people very angry? But I think when you saw those kids delivering those same kinds of messages, you there's not anger. It's just I, I need to be heard, right? And that's what this speaks to, bringing our humanity together and listening to one another. So. Moving on to goal number three. Okay. 
All right, so goal number three is the professional practice goal, and this is just the one where I do all of the new superintendent induction program work. Um, I have, in accordance with all of this, I meet uh, monthly with my mentor. We meet for about six hours a month. I have attended all of the NISIP meetings August 10th, October 3rd, November 14th, and January 9th are all complete. Um, I have written an entry plan, and I have written a findings document that we'll talk about tonight. Um, I think I am earning proficient ratings on all of my assignments. <laughs> and uh, the reflect on and professionally learn from my mentor's visits. My mentor has obviously come to a school committee meeting, and he has come to an admin council meeting. And he and I also visited the middle school, and I want to thank Mr. Keller for that, because Mr. Keller provided an phenomenal tour of sort of different learning and it was all in science and math classrooms and you could see just different kinds of instructional models happening uh, we were in classrooms where we saw you know sort of the highest achievers in the Hopkinton public schools and we saw kids who were struggling we saw co taught classrooms uh, we saw classrooms where voice and choice were offered and it was just a really amazing tour and I think my mentor thinks Mr. Keller is very special so. <laughs> and he is so that's where I am with that one. I also think, you know, I just want to add this, that, um, you know, building your own repertoire, I've seen you um, work with other district leaders and reach out to them and um, not hesitate learning from your colleagues in other districts. So maybe that's something you should consider adding. Yes, and, and that's actually very commonplace among superintendents. I bet every day I can get one to two emails where people will reach out and ask a question about, you know, what does your preschool look like or what does, you know, just all kinds of questions that we solicit information from each other. And it's a really nice network of support. Right. This is my student achievement goal. Uh, the student achievement goal is really based on our worry that uh, the state is now looking at the lowest 25% of our learners. And for the very first time, the 10th graders at the high school are going to take the new MCAS test. And so we want to make sure that our lowest 25% uh, by the previous MCAS, that's how, how you determine your lowest 25%, are ready for that test. And so I have been working with the special education department at the high school as well as the English department at the high school, just making sure that there's good communication between those two groups. And quite honestly, not every student who's in the lowest 25% are kids who are defined as a student with disability or a student on an IEP. And I think that, you know, we're sort of opening the communication between the two departments, but also taking a look at what is the new testing going to look like and what does um, good writing instruction look like. So I have met with them on September 14th, November 6th, and the third meeting with them will be on February 1st. Uh, I did have a smaller meeting with just special educators, and I met with the special educators sort of in isolation to ensure that they had a good understanding of what was expected because I didn't want them to worry that their focus could only be on writing instruction or English language arts writing instruction. I would like to see everybody doing writing across the curriculum. So what does it look like when students write in social studies? What does it look like when students write in science? And I understand that when you're a special educator, you're not just worried about writing, but you're worried about students in reading and math and you know some of the soft skills. I mean, do you you know, have your, your binder in your backpack can often be a question. So I didn't want them to think that this was going to occupy all of their time, but I did want to impress upon them the importance of kids being able to um, approach this, this test with, you know, a, little, a few more tools in their toolbox. Um, every time I meet with the combined groups, both uh, special education and English, I do um, send out a survey. So I've conducted two of the three surveys, and I have gotten feedback from them. I do have some samples of student work. I did not attach samples of student work, but we have some portfolios, and that's what we'll actually be looking at. So we'll use the looking at student work protocol for the February 1st um, session that we will have here. 
And I have actually put all of these materials uh, sort of together myself, and I'm kind of hoping that uh, people are appreciating that. So let's hope it goes where I want it to, or where we all want it to. <coughs> Excuse me. Yes. And that's actually a, a, a goal that I sort of share with Dr. Zaleski, so she's been very helpful in that work as well. And the last one is goal number five, and that was the goal that I had put together around the budget. Um, and I think that you've sort of been along for the ride to watch that whole thing unfold. Um, we, again, you can see that yellow highlighting because we did not get our NESDEC data until very, very recently. Um, but most of what you see here has already been completed, and I think the important thing for me was that this budget is a budget that is really based in student need and a lot of the things that we sort of saw unfolding as I went through the entry finding report, and I, I feel like this will be a budget that can get us into uh, next year with some safety as long as it, and we know from last week that it's predicated really on at least 100 new kids coming into the district, but sort of an equal distribution across 13 grade levels. So uh, that will need to be in place for this particular budget to be as effective as we hope it will be. I just Two questions. I apologize. I didn't, I didn't get them in the flow because I have to process okay. first. No, that's fine. Um, on your um, strategic goal, the first one, process-wise, is there going to be um, a delegate from school committee who's working um, in a committee on strategy, or is this being done more by the admin team? So I think that, and, and this is a very good question, one of the elements on the rubric um, sort of talks about how do you get buy-in from your admin team. So when I met with them on January 8th, one of the things I said to them, they said, will there be a steering committee? And I said, I really feel like that has to be sort of the work of this group here. And that doesn't preclude anyone from being part of focus group work or, you know, sort of taking this plan in different directions. But I think that if we are going to commit ourselves to looking at things like teaching and learning and budget and, and all of those things, we really have to make sure that those are the things that this admin team believes in. So one of the administrators did say, will there be a steering committee? And I had to say, I think that, that we will sort of be our sort of collective steering committee here. Um, and when we, do, when we start rolling out focus groups, the consultant from DESE will take this thing right out to the community for us. And, you know, at that point, yes, there'll be administrators or teachers or school committee members or uh, parents or all kinds of people who are part and parcel of the focus groups. Uh, but I think that one of the things that we will hope to do is to kind of cr create very broad topics. Is it? Um, according to the consultant, is that sort of a typical process? That's sort of a typical not process. Like a broader steering steer committee? Yes. Um, the, and in fact, that's one of the things that she had discussed with us because she came to the January 8th meeting to sort of meet everybody and, and have this dialogue. Um, but one of the things that we find is if there's a, a steering committee that has, you know, two parents, one school committee member, three administrators, then those three administrators may go back to you know, Hopkins or Elmwood or the middle school, but without representation from that entire team in going through that initial process, very often people say, oh, that's really nice, you did a good job on that, and sometimes it's not even sort of read or fostered or loved or valued, and it ends up on a shelf somewhere. So having as much administrator buy-in in the beginning as we can is really important. If they are that sort of layer that moves this thing forward for three years. So will there be interim reports to school committee on how things are shaping up? Or sure. will it be absolutely at the end and sort of see it and then vote on it in its entirety? Oh no, I don't think that we'll just go from here to <laughs> it's April. It's sure, yes. Surprise. So yeah. It might be helpful uh, to take to maybe if we outline and discuss the process so that we all can understand where because it is a this is a different process than what we used the last time we did the strategic plan just so that we can all okay so the other that ju just separate from the I don't want to derail your no that's okay now. the consultant did uh, and I have not looked at it because it's been a busy couple of days but she had sent me sort of a 
I guess a very sort of loose timeline to see what we what we thought about you know all of the events that will take place between sort of now and June 30th um, and I think that you know as I send that out to administrators I'm happy to send it to the five of you as well it makes good sense yeah. Sorry, my only other question was on the um, diversity goal I know that when you were forming the goals we talked about um, metrics and, and the idea of um, curriculum changes reflecting, you know, being reflected, and that it was too early in the first year because it's still, there's still sort of an onboarding of the messaging and understanding the topic. But I know at the forums, um, at least in the first forum, um, there were definitely pockets in the district where there are curriculum modifications being incorporated based on new awareness of biases in our materials. So I'm just wondering, although it's not specifically a metric, I'm wondering if when you report back on this goal, if you could maybe share um, any awareness you have of curriculum modifications. Because I do think that is one measurable thing mm -hmm. that um, makes an impact in the classroom when, when students can see themselves in the curriculum more readily. I think it makes a big difference. And I know it's happening, I've heard it in Elmwood in certain pockets. Um, and I'm sure as you're talking with people, they're sort of self-reflecting on their own teaching. And I mean, our teachers are so dedicated. I'm sure as they're taking this message on, it's a, sort of a natural process. But if we're aware of anything, it'd be good to know. Sure. Yeah. And Jen, you should probably speak to this. So we did actually have a student in the middle school who approached the administration and said, I don't ever see myself in the curriculum. And so Jen went to a meeting with that student and Mr. Keller. So do you want to talk a little bit about it? Yeah. Um, it was a sixth grade student who was incredibly bright and articulate and said he'd been feeling this way really throughout his journey in the public schools. And uh, he wanted to know what could be done about this. So could we out of class? Um, you know, what kinds of things could be done? His point was when we talk about African Americans specifically in our curriculum, we talk about um, the challenges, some of the downfalls, some of the unfortunate circumstances that they face throughout history and why aren't we talking about some of the great African-American leaders um, and people that have really made a very positive impact um, that he as a student would see as a role model. So we talked a little bit about some of the work that's been done. Um, he shared with us a book that um, he'd been reading that his parents had gotten for him talking about African-Americans and Latin Americans throughout history. And so Mr. Keller and I jotted down the information about that because it talked a little bit in that book um, he shared with us about implications for classroom. Um, one of the things that Mr. Keller offered to him, um, you know, in addition to, I think, kind of what Carol talked about earlier is, and I think what you're referencing is our continued work at looking at curriculum and figuring out ways to address the things that he raised. Um, the middle school has a peer mentoring um, group that began this year that focuses specifically on kind of a culture and, and um, diversity kind of through their work with the ADL. I'm probably not explaining it exactly the right way, but it has to do with um, challenges with culture and backgrounds and things like that that students may bring to the forefront. So Mr. Keller immediately got the students set up with one of the assistant principals who's running that group and talked about some planning for that student to help become a peer leader. Uh, in that area in the school for next year when he's a seventh grader. And we also touched a little bit on the diversity forum that Carol put together earlier in the year with, you know, you were all there with the student voices and we talked about um, thinking about ways to share the student voice um, at the middle school level as well as the high school level. Uh, so, you know, we didn't have any hard and fast answers for him. It's not something we can fix or, you know, come to any kind of answer tomorrow. But I think the heightened awareness, sharing his message out with the faculty so they're aware of it, those are the kinds of things we can begin working with. But it, it was a very impressive young man and a, a really powerful conversation. I think it's great that he was able to articulate that. I think it's definitely something that students feel for any number of reasons. I mean, yes. So it's, it's great that we have a representative in the student body who can articulate mm -hmm. that. And you know, thank you for listening to him. But I think I'm hoping, based on other things that I've heard anecdotally, that we do more of that, more reflecting on our curriculum choices. And well, one we thing I can add, if you don't mind, it, that he mentioned. Um, so I'd met at some point with Mr. Hay earlier in the year, and we were talking about the music program. 
and he mentioned that based on feedback that he'd received from students that they were really expanding the repertoire of musical pieces um, in the band and some of the musical performances and this student that we'd met with actually is a musician and he has an older brother at the high school and he told me that his mother had commented on the change in type of music that was being performed this year and that his mother was so impressed that, oh my God, I can't believe they knew that composer and that they've incorporated that in the music program. Um, so that's you know another type of curriculum change that we're starting to see. Thank you. I love hearing when, not to jump in, but when students have their, bring their voice forward at mm -hmm. that age, it's really it's particularly great. impressive. So. And so the last thing I think I'd like to talk about tonight are the entry findings report. For tonight, I think I'll just walk through it very quickly with you. So in the introduction, I describe uh, why a person would undertake this. And even though I've been in the district for a couple of years, I think it's really important to sort of step back and take a look at all of the quantitative data, but also go through the district and go through the community and really listen to voices so that I can hear what's important to people. Uh, when the admin team went through this document, I don't want to use the word struggled, but we, we looked at this and we, we thought, well, are the voices that you hear in here representative of great big numbers of people? Do a lot of people feel this way? And one of the things that we talked about was if we have people who were willing to come out and willing to have their voices heard, then it's very important to them. And I think it's just important for us to, to listen to, to what people have to say, whether it's you know, a majority of parents, a minority of parents, but just by virtue of the fact that people had things to say, I think it was important when these themes started to emerge that I would put them all together. So I start out by also including our current mission statement, vision statement, and core values. And then I define the process, which you already know a whole lot about. Um, the next section just goes through the current state of the district. And it's sort of that 30,000 foot view um, how many schools do we have? Who goes to those schools? Uh, we're having some budgetary uh, grow growing pains because we are get becoming a bigger and bigger and bigger school district. Um, who are the students who go here just in terms of enrollment data? And where do they go when they leave the Hopkinton Public Schools? Um, I talk a little bit about how important social emotional learning has been for us over the last five years and that some of our social emotional behavioral work ties in with our culture and diversity work but at the end of the day the most important thing is that our students are feeling safe and cared for and if they feel those ways then they can certainly better access our curriculum um, i talk a little bit about the educators who uh, are in our buildings every day uh, we are really blessed to have a um, very stable and talented administrative team, a very talented teaching force, and kids who are, you know, by and large, just very, very good kids. Uh, I frequently tell the story of you know, just being in classrooms, and when the bell rings and students leave, they will very often say to the teacher in the classroom, thank you. And for, for me, that, that speaks volumes to, you know, their care for public education and their care for the people who are teaching them. So at the start of this, I have all of the qualitative data. And if several people said it to me, um, I actually uh, thought it was important enough to include. So I went through those topics, and I just put them in here alphabetically. So that's, that's the reason for the organization. Uh, the first is budget and town finance. Uh, one of the things that um, I heard coming to me very frequently were things about uh, the budget and how we are growing rapidly. There's a need for buildings and people are worried about the budget sort of keeping pace with the demands of the schools. And I even heard that from students here at the high school. So during that, that listening tour, uh, it was kind of amazing to me that 14 year olds had that same concern. Uh, they, people said, you know, we've done a very good job of holding back the tide, but we've lived with this sort of year-to-year -year mentality. We think about, well, what did FY19 look like? What will FY20 look like? But it probably makes a whole lot better sense to start projecting out for several years and thinking about where we're going to need to be in three years or four years. Uh, the explosion in population, 
was something that was of great concern to people because there's been this expansion of high-priced homes. Uh, but there are several people who have lived here for a very long time and hope that the town maintains its affordability. And among those people are probably some of our elderly people who would um, like to be able to age in place. And they want to be able to, for that to be affordable to them. Um, project Just Because reported to me that there's probably a very large untapped client base out there, but you know people's individual and family pride keeps them from uh, reaching out to Project Just Because. Uh, but even while you know that sort of uh, story is being presented, we have historically been a district that you know doesn't really frequently say no to things. So we can have a new highway department, a new library, new public schools, um, and and we continue to add. Uh, at the end of the day, one person said to me that uh, she thought it was really important that we just have a one Hopkinton mindset, and I kind of liked that language, so I incorporated that. Uh, in terms of buildings and grounds, uh, I think that we are all aware that uh, the high school is very close to capacity on a daily basis, that the middle school in Emwood probably could use a little bit of a facelift. Uh, the students who are at the high school um, were very, very funny when they were describing the middle school. So they come to the high school and, and they say, looking back, that middle school. But I guess when you're living in it, you don't actually recognize what it looks like. Uh, but overcrowding, I think, in terms of building and grounds is, is our big concern. Uh, pretty much to a one, parents reported that they feel like communication coming out of our buildings is excellent. Principals in this district are constantly using Instagram, Twitter, you know, Facebook, newsletters, whatever it is that they can push information out to people. And I think that that's been very effective. Uh, I also get a lot of feedback about culture. And I thought some of the, the feedback I got about culture was, was very lovely. Uh, one person said that Hopkinton has enjoyed a nice brand. And another person told me that Hopkinton not only brings the sizzle, but also <laughs> delivers the steak. And I thought that, that was a really nice way to say, while we enjoy, I think, like a really lovely reputation statewide, I think that our kids leave here very well prepared. And I think that the teachers are, you know, every single day putting forth the best effort and bringing, you know, rigor and good programming and good instruction. So hence the steak. Dr. Cavanaugh, um, you know, on, on the communication one, um, I've heard about consistency being a concern personally as talking to people. Is that something you heard during your tour? For me, most of the parents that I spoke to did say that they feel like they get very good communication. Um, and I think maybe that comes consistently from the building level. Maybe from teacher to teacher in classroom, they use different methods to right, push exactly. out information. And exactly. so that might be the inconsistency that you're talking right. about. Th that's exactly what I have heard. Yes. Currently in the district, there is sort of no set way for any teacher to put information out to people. So whatever it is that you choose to do as an educator, that's how you send out information. And really, there's also, I think, a sort of a gradual release uh, model. So at the elementary level, lots of information goes out to parents. By the time kids are at the high school level, it's our belief that, you know, to foster sort of autonomy and, and get them to a place of independence, we just send information out mostly to the kids. What's the best way to share some specific examples about concerns on communication with you? Oh, you can just send me an email is fine. Or anyone in the community who would like yes, to do exactly. that, that's perfectly there, there, fine. There were, there were some thoughts around the fact that, you, you know, to your point, one would expect more communication when kids are younger. And, you know, it changes. I don't think it reduces, but the model changes as they get older, right? So I, I think there, there are instances where it's a lot because there's no policy or any set procedure on how teachers are expected to do that. I think it's on their teacher's personality and some of them are very communicative, they use social media, they use Twitter, they use a lot of pictures. And so then you have another class where the parent hears from the other parent that, oh, you haven't seen the pictures? I'm like, no, I didn't get anything. So I think there may be a little bit of that, too, and someone sharing a lot about what's going on in the classroom and the other teacher taking a different approach. So those are the things that I've heard. And um, you know, if, if that would be something, as we get into the strategic plan, I hope we look to put some kind of a guideline, if you will, on what's the minimum 
right? Mm -hmm. The rest is your personality. Yes. Uh, I, I think that would be helpful. Mm -hmm. So I, I'll probably uh, request, I've heard this very strongly. Okay. For sure. I'll share, I'll, I'll ask them to share it with you directly. That's great. Thank you. still in culture. Uh, so there are, are some things that we think are um, affecting the climate, which in turn will affect the culture of our schools. Uh, so you know we have a changing demographic. Uh, we have uh, a lot of social media out there. Uh, and, and I think that there are some teachers who are looking at some of that social media and thinking that a lot of it is making commentary about schools. Um, and then the, the third thing that people talked about in terms of culture was or that sort of threat to our kids' social, emotional, academic well-being just because, you know, the stakes are so high all the time. And it wasn't just parents who said that. I had students who said, nope, when we come to school in the morning, we understand that, you know, this is high stakes, this is high school, we have to do our best, we have to do our best every day. Huh. So I, I think that that pressure is very real for our kids and our teachers. Dr. Kavner, when you um, thought of culture, uh, was it primarily driven by what the students are facing? How much of it is what the staff is experiencing? Oh, yes, I think that most of what we're talking about here is what the staff is experiencing in terms of, of culture. You know, when we talk about the stress on kids, kids did say that, but parents said that also quite loudly. So the teachers are comfortable with the culture that they're experiencing, their own growth and acceptance of teachers, because that's an important part of it, too. Oh, I think that the teachers feel like the culture in our buildings is excellent. Supportive you know, of Yes, and I too. think that, oh, yes, and I think that the, uh, the principals think that as well. I mean, when we had this conversation uh, on Tuesday about the culture in our buildings, you know, I think that the culture is very strong. People feel like they belong, they're invigorated, the principals you know, value them, parents value them, students value them. I, I think that the culture here is very, very good. It's That's a good great. place to work. That's great. Uh, and then the only other thing that we talked about with culture was uh, the culture of our five individual buildings is very different. Mm -hmm. It's no wrong culture, there's no right culture, there's no good culture, there's no bad culture, it's just different. And so if you are a kid who's used to the culture at Marathon, then when you get to Elmwood, or if you're a parent who's used to the culture at Marathon, you get to Elmwood and it's very different. And then you get to Hopkins and it's very different. I think every school sort of enjoys its own brand, but we could probably do something with a little more consistency. Uh, the next category is uh, curriculum and instruction. I think students and parents did question a little bit of the progression of the curriculum. Would it be possible to incorporate more flexibility, uh, more voice and choice? Um, and I think that when we're talking about the elementary level, uh, it's an interesting phenomenon because elementary teachers are pulling groups all day. And as they're pulling groups, there really is a lot of differentiation taking place there. But somehow in kids' minds, as they leave those places, they think that they all sort of got the same thing. They really didn't all get the same thing, but they perceived that they all got the same thing. And maybe that happens because by the time you get to the high school level, you have opportunities for you know, orchestra or robotics or AP, U.S. history. There are just so many opportunities that it feels very, very different from the way it felt when we were building foundational skills. Yeah, uh, one of the other things that, that we talked a lot about was, um, so, you know, it, it's really nice to have all of that kind of differentiation, and yet, you know, we're worried at some times about um, offering kids reading support, offering kids math support, um, even though, you know, very often we are very much uh, above the state and, and national norms. You know, as we kind of look at, at the kids in front of us, we do have to make sure that kids are reading and you know, doing math at grade level. Um, so you can't lose them along the way. So how do we have that kind of differentiation, offer kids voice and choice, and yet make sure that all of our kids are landing at, at grade level? And Dr. Kavanaugh, I have some general questions and, you know, just trying to better understand that what is to be expected of kids in terms of reading and, you know, when do they pick up the skills? How much do we push them? And, you know, every child is different. Each one of us is different. 
So how do we set those guidelines? Are these driven by Desi? Who defines that you should be reading this by this age? And what if the child is different? Are we pushing them um, in a direction just because MCAS is guiding it? What is the guideline? I'm just trying to understand that. So and maybe you could speak to this too. But so you do get standards from DESE that, that talk about you know where students should be with reading. But we also have all kinds of, and one of the things that we'll talk about in here is that sort of progress monitoring and, and levels where we're assessing kids all the time. You know, where is their reading level? If you are in the third month of second grade, you know, this is roundabout where you should be. And what if you're not there? You know, what does that mean? Does it mean that you're sort of a late bloomer? Does it mean that you come from a household where that's, you know, not print rich, so you haven't had a whole lot of experience with language and literacy? Or does it mean that there's some undiagnosed problem? You know, so that's, I think that's sort of why we keep that monitoring going. You're the expert in elementary. Well, I mean, I think we could spend an entire evening on the question, but I think kind of in simplest terms, we do use a research-based system called Fountas and Pinnell, which is based out of Lesley University with two research who are really the, the forerunners in literacy instruction. So when teachers start talking about, oh, they're a level P, they're a level J, whatever it may be, um, our district in pretty much every district around, that's kind of the gold standard of how we measure reading progress. And it's all based on an enormous continuum of what a student should be, know and be able to do at level A and what they should know and be able to do at level Z. Actually, even begins before level A. Um, and mm -hmm. it's, it's one data point, so that's why we have many different types of measures. We have the MCAS, we have the, the Fountas and Pinnell assessment system, um, and many more beyond that. But that's really, um, it's a very detailed, it's very similar to the rubric that Dr. Kavanaugh shared earlier tonight. There are many, many checkpoints um, that educators use before they would progress a child from reading at a level A to a level B. Um, and it's, you know, there are a lot of, there are a lot of pieces that go along with that um, in terms of kind of to your point in Carol's about the differences between students. And that's why we really tend to err on the conservative side when students are younger, when they're five and when they're six. Um, because some kids just, January or first grade, a lot of things explode. Exactly. Um, because they're, right. they're finally ready. Right. And, you know, there's parent anxiety, too. Mm -hmm. When you see uh, your friend's child going all the way up and you hear this in the classroom, oh, he, you know, this child hasn't reached there. So um, I feel like there are some norms around that, and I, I hope that we're not putting any external pressures um, that, that make kids feel less or somehow off uh, just because they're not there yet. And I don't think, um, I know for sure that's not something that we're doing intentionally, um, but I also can't deny that at a certain point in time, if a child realizes, you know, my peers are exceeding my ability, but for that reason, we have interventionists, we have these leveled materials, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have support systems in place to help those children and make sure they get where they need to be. Thank you. You're welcome. Just a couple more things on instructional concerns, and I think I'll just repeat what I had said earlier tonight, uh, that people are looking for increased differentiation, project-based learning, personalized learning, experiential learning, links to Hopkinton senior citizens, internship opportunities for students, a formalized K-12 STEAM program, a partnership with a community college. Um, and there were also people who said that uh, it would be nice for more of our students to take advantage of Keefe Tech. We talked a little bit about the efficacy of the co-teaching model in special education, and it's just important for everyone to realize that that looks very differently if you are in a middle school math classroom or a second grade literacy classroom. Uh, in terms of other kinds of programs, uh, there were people who thought that we should have a building to building transitional planning. Uh, program that some parents would like help with understanding the IEP, um, that people would like to see an upgraded 18 to 22 program, that there would be people who would like to have um, better outcomes for any of the soft skills, so things like guidance, uh, school psychologists, school adjustment counselors, any of those specialized programs, if we could sort of streamline those and move the ship in, in perhaps one uh, 
consistent direction. Parents did report that uh, stress levels are high, and when we talked about some of the ways to use SEL uh, to mitigate some of those things at the elementary levels, people talked about using PBIS, which is Positive Behavior Intervention Systems, or Responsive Classroom. Uh, people talked a little bit about technology, and they, that was sort of a mixed bag. Some people wondered, are we in a state of hyper-technology? And other people um, were very pleased to say that the technology department here is exceptional, and having one-to-one -one devices is you know, just a marvelous instructional tool. And then the next section just has quantitative data. You probably have seen lots of this. The STAR data that we use, we use it to complement uh, the regular classroom math assessments and any other reading assessments. Uh, sometimes we also use QRI for, for reading. But the nice thing, I think, about STAR reading and STAR math is it's helpful with progress monitoring. So when we identify that a student is struggling in either one of those areas, we can kind of uh, see how they're doing at intervals during the year. <coughs> we realize that, you know, even though we say 90% of our kids are reading at grade level, if we think about, you know, for example, like the eighth grade, given that, that size of a class, you know, that could be 32 kids who are not reading at grade level in the eighth grade. So these kinds of progress, progress monitoring tools are really helpful to us in being able to assess and sort of diagnose problems and then offer some kind of intervention. Dr. Kamenow, uh, I know we have moved on to the next session, uh, section. One question I have on the curriculum and instruction, the last sentence talks to professional development. It was reported um, is lacking for paraprofessionals and specialists. Um, was there any conversation with substitute teachers? But we don't provide any professional development for substitute teachers beyond sort of typical school safety. No. Thank you. And then there's MCAS data here, which Jen had shown to you a few months ago when she did her MCAS presentation, so I won't belabor the point about that. And section on equity data, so you can see some statistics regarding special education. MCAS results showing outcomes for both girls and boys in the 2018 and 2017 years, and you can see some of the places where boys, especially in literacy, are lagging. Uh, there's some social-emotional learning data. The state now does vocal data for us, and uh, they do it for the high school, the middle school, and Hopkins. So some of the outcomes uh, for the high school, the middle school, and Hopkins are uh, on page 17. So, for example, 57% of students say that they worry about grades, which in turn makes it hard to enjoy school. So that's something that, that we heard at the high school. As you read down toward uh, Hopkins, you can sort of see that, you know, kids don't seem to have that sort of same anxiety. And, you know, that raises questions as to why, you know, and maybe it's because kids are, are far less aware of differences in, you know, how well I read, what I look like, what I'm good at. Um, or, you know, maybe kids just haven't sort of perfected the art of unkindness. It's, it's you know, sort of a mixed bag there, but that might be something for us to, to sort of look into. Um, the English learner data is here in 2017, 77.5% of our district's K-8 uh, L students met their learning targets, and in 2018 it went up to 92.1% of our kids were meeting targets. Student discipline data is there, and student attendance rates. Interestingly, student discipline data sort of mirrors what happens across the state. Uh, at schools like Marathon, Elmwood, Hopkins, the incidences of these kinds of behaviors, and if you're reporting a behavior to the Department of Elementary and Secondary, it's a pretty egregious uh, infraction. So uh, by the time you get to the middle school and the high school, there are more incidents of disciplined um, being reported to DESE, and I think that that just sort of comes with age. That's not uncommon across the state. Uh, the last line, I think, uh, in the first paragraph is important because I think one of the things that we do here is we uh, believe in educative approaches rather than punitive, and I think that our administration would say that those approaches have worked really well for Hopkinton, and I think that the DESE data does seem to validate that. Um, and then finally, it closes with student uh, attendance rates, that quantitative part. And 
I would like to encourage all parents to keep sending your children to school because our attendance rates are higher than they should be. Attendance or so. absence rates? Oh, I'm sorry. Absence <laughs> rates are higher than they should be. Sorry. Yes. We need higher attendance, lower absence. There we go. Dr. Kavanaugh, the vocal data on, uh, for HHS, 57% 50 per, of students saying they worry about their grades, which in turn makes it hard to enjoy school. That's a big number, 57%. That's a big number. It is. And that 15% say they have stayed home because they felt unsafe at, or that they've been picked on or teased by peers mm -hmm. because of their real or perceived sexual preferences. Both of those uh, mm -hmm. are, yes. are you know, sizable numbers. They are, and you know, we put them in the report because it's something that you know, we Needs want to, to be address. addressed, yes. absolutely. I mean, this could be, sort of glassy and pretty and tied up with a bow, but I think putting the reality out there is something that helps us to grow as a district. Absolutely. It's appreciated. Um, on the student discipline data, where you said this is typical, you know, the jump from, say, elementary, where you're talking about one or two kids, and then middle school eight and high school 30, I'm wondering how much of it is, pair, you know, kids being vocal and actually being ready to report it, right? Versus, uh, you know, how, how many take the step to report it, right? So I'm just wondering, are we doing what we need to do to address this before we reach that state where we reach to the 30 number? In the discipline category? Yes. Something to think about. I know this is not for now, but this is a strategic mm -hmm. plan as you're laying it out um, to think about is there room for us to improve in that area mm -hmm. beforehand? Right. I wonder if, you know, social, emotional, behavioral programs. You know, and one of the things that I have talked to the high school administration or maybe all administrators about uh, just sort of that notion that there are proactive and sort of reactive things that we can do. So we have, you know, when a student becomes dysregulated, you have a program for him and, and he goes there, but what is it you can do proactively to sort of prevent the dysregulation from the beginning, if that's possible? I mean, I, we can't obviously say that that's possible for every child, right? Or to build up social-emotional competencies. How can we do that kind of instruction in a classroom? Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. Just out of curiosity, with, with the disciplinary stuff, is some of that be related to, uh, for example, if there was substance abuse in the high school, that you wouldn't see that in the, presumably, in exactly. Marathon or Elmwood, so that students are being disciplined for things that you would hope don't occur at all. In the that big range. kids do and little kids don't. Yes. 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 That's helpful for context. Dr. Kavanaugh, did you hear during your tours a need for better partnership um, with parents? And, you know, for instance, all this SEL work, the disciplinary work, or even the diversity related work, this is not the work of the schools alone. Right. right. So it's a partnership. So, how, did that emerge out of your listening tour that there is a need to? build that bridge and that connection that what you're talking in the schools is reiterated um, somehow. I know the ownership can't be on, on the schools, but that dialogue needs to occur often. I mean, I know that uh, uh, Mrs. Carver at Elmwood would send those things, you know, talk to your child about these things, and some parents don't appreciate that. They think it's preaching. Um, I personally like that reminder that, you know, just a reminder and kind of knowing what's going on in the school that you're teaching these three-step thing. And if you repeat that in, at home, that'll stick with the child. And it's a tool, effective tool for parents who want to use it. So how do we build that connection ultimately? Because this is the bedrock for our kids, their social emotional safety before they can focus on academics. Yeah, I think in some ways you just offer, and obviously we don't have the answers because this is not designed to have answers, right? Yes. It's just designed yes. to be questions. Yes. But I think you know, when you offer programs for parents, uh, you can put it out there and hopefully 
know, parents would like to engage. So, for example, Mary Ellen Grady um, and Samantha Harris doing the mindfulness program at the middle school. It's a lovely opportunity, I think, for parents to better understand some of the things that are happening at the middle school with their children every day. And if the kids are decompressing and the parents are decompressing, that's really nice, right? Uh, Justin Pominville and I were talking this morning, and he said you know, he had gone to a professional development workshop where uh, they had generated research saying that if a teacher, even the teacher's own private life, was practicing mindfulness, it trickled down in the classroom to the kids, and those kids ended up being higher achieving students because they were in a classroom where the teacher engaged in mindfulness. Right. I thought that was lovely. Yeah. So in terms of next steps, because we're going to take this and kind of absorb it and come back Absolutely. to it in February. Yeah, I'm just so we are not going to look for comment or question at this point. Is that you do not want perfect? Okay, yes. I just I'm aware of the time too. So yes. we will come back to this uh, in February. So that brings us up. Then is in, do you have anything else? Thank in your you. Report? I'm all done. This is fantastic. I do not, and I know how much work. I can only it's imagine. A lot of work. I, I don't know. <laughs> yes. I can only imagine how much work. Oh, thank you. I want to ask about that. I know we're going back to this, but um, the next steps, the process, uh, about what we're talking about. The focus groups, the focus of the focus groups. I'm just curious, by the time a focus group occurs, will there already be sort of a new vision or a new strategic? Like, is it sort of how to then accomplish a, an already determined next vision, or is it to come up with what we want our... Well, I think there'll be broad topics. Okay. So I'll give you a good example. One of the things that we had talked about on Tuesday was the question of communication. And communication so that the end result would be people had a great understanding of the needs in the schools. And typically that wouldn't be part of your strategic plan if things were going along in a way that you know, there had been no great changes in our community. But with the addition of so many students coming into the district and that resulting in bulging buildings and increased buses and need for staff, and at some point we are going to reach that sort of bursting place, right, where, where it's not sustainable anymore. And so how much communication do we need to have and research and information that just continues to go out to the community? And would that be something that we were interested in and thinking about that as a strategic objective, right? So communication might be one of those topics that we put out to the community and say, what do you think? So, so I'm just, um, I'm not sure how this all exactly plays out. So I'll just throw this out there and okay. move along. But um, just a couple of just two thoughts. One, I, I know I agree with you that if a parent or staff member, or community member came to you with something, it should be it should be taken seriously. They took the trouble to bring that up. I do also know that lots of people are very happy with a lot of things, and if you don't hear from them, it doesn't mean that change is warranted. So if correct, you know, so in the past there have been times programmatically along the road of, of my children's education where a positive voice was not articulated. So a broad problem was interpreta interpreted when maybe it didn't exist. Right. So I guess I would just be cautious about the lack of you know, maybe positive voices or, or the breadth of voices that you might have heard, because there are a lot of happy people yes. who like things and don't want, you know, necessarily want change. So um, that, the other thing, um, kind of going back to curriculum and, and programming, Again, it's a strategic vision sort of a thing. I guess I'm, I'm asking if this will come out. Because I think parents wonder, going to your leveling question, is the objective of this year for my student to get them to the, the grade level um, proficiency as determined by standards? Or is the objective for my student to go from where they are now to one giant step forward, regardless of where the start was? So, so it's, so I, I guess, strategically or vision-wise, education-wise, setting a parent's expectation about what our district is doing and, and how our efforts are being expended, I think will help if parents can be clear as yes. to what the expectation is. Is it that if my child walks into second grade reading at a sixth grade level, then are we going to get them to seventh grade level? Or are we going to help them develop other skills that maybe are less developed? So it, that's the kind of thing that I think parents don't always understand 
what we're trying to do and if it would help if we could articulate that. Yes, I think that that is important. You know, in the same vein, if you have a student who enters second grade and they're reading at, you know, the beginning of first grade level, according to, you know, Fountas and Pinnell BAS data or whatever, or STAR data, um, is the goal then to get them to the end of second grade by the end of second grade because that's really two years of growth in a single year for a student who's already struggling. So is that realistic to explain to a parent or, or really what were we hoping for instead of the achievement, the growth? Exactly. Right. I, totally, I, I totally agree. I think setting expectations with parents, I think you know, talking also about the stress level going to middle school, I think parents' stress level increases tremendously when their kids go to middle school. They hear it's middle school, it's a new thing, it's a more important thing. The stress in general goes up, so and the communication starts to fall off. Yes. So it's a weird confluence mm -hmm. of factors, but I think the more our strategic plan can articulate expectations and our, where, what we're trying to accomplish, I think it will help parents know what to expect. I agree. And so that's sort of a general comment. Yes. Okay. And thank you. Mm -hmm. So we'll come back to all of this uh, February. I, I, I agree with Jen. This is a tremendous body of work um, that obviously, I don't know how you found the time between the last December focus group and this to put that all together. So. You just didn't oh, sleep in two or three weeks. Along the yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is quite a bit. Uh, and then also if we could come back to the strategic plan to th that process. Yes, absolutely. To, get greater, to understand it better for all of us and kind of figure out how we're going forward. Mm -hmm. So, did you have other stuff for your report other than? No. Okay. <laughs> I bet you're wishing I had less stuff. <laughs> uh, in that case, I will move into the school committee chair report, which is that I have approved for payroll, pay, pay, approved for payment, the payroll warrants S19014. Payroll warrant has been included in your packet. So I will move on. I do not have an update on the office hours because we obviously didn't have them. So that will bring us, uh, we already did that, to, um, old, uh, we already did the new business. So that brings us to old business, um, which is the school committee policy BIA, new school committee member orientation. Um, and do we want to, I know that you and Mina have worked on this uh, quite a bit. No, um, I was just going to hand back. this over to Mina. Um, <laughs> I'll absolutely take this. So it was a very easy document, I think, to update from the last time that we looked at it. One of the things that we agreed upon was that we should say that each new member should be given access to the following materials, and that is because we very rarely hand out paper to people anymore. So all of the a copy of, a copy of went away. Uh, number seven, the district strategy document and school improvement plans that wasn't on the list and we thought that those were important documents to give to new members. And also the school committee meeting norms that are in existence at the time that you come on board, even if they are immediately updated after you come on board in the summertime, it's just important to be able to share those norms. Okay. I don't know if you wanted to jump in anywhere because no, this, this is really is kind of your baby. Uh, then we talked about um, a couple of the other things that would be really nice for the chair and the superintendent to do and one of them would be to help new members by arranging visits to the school so if there's a new member who chooses to have some kind of an introductory guided tour um, I would be happy to take them through the five buildings so that they can kind of get a feel of what it looks like inside and meet the administration um, and then the other thing that we thought maybe uh, would be good for a new member to know would be to how to fill a liaison role thing I might add to this little list is meeting the um, administrative assistant, um, you know, Georgette in our case. I think it's not, if you haven't served on school committee, you might not know that she's there and that she also supports school committee. Yeah, that was, was a pretty was actually, critical role. It was actually new, was new news to me that we had someone who supported us administratively. Sure. So. The one thing that I might add in at the in the very first paragraph is the where it says eight hours of orientation training. I, I wonder if it would be helpful to specify that that's MASC training as opposed to like what we're doing down here. It's separate in an addition to. Yeah. Sure. 
because I think that's... Well, that's a good point, because I, I read that once at first, and I was like, wait, did I do that? But then I remembered that it was the MESC. Yeah, yeah. It's, just it's good mandated, right? MASC. Yeah, it is mandated. It is required. So, so just those two changes we be saying. So you talked about meeting um, the administrative assistant, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, is that something that you want in the policy because we have the checklist, right, attached? Because we have kept oh. this higher level in the policy. So if you look at the checklist, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I do think the MASC, the 8-hour training, um, that I think we should clarify that that's the MASC training. Um, that's a good point, Mina. You're t keeping this very, mm -hmm. like you said, higher order stuff. So I think the specifics should go in the checklist, and then they don't ever have to be voted on if things change. Yeah. Right, smart. In the policy itself, um, the last sentence is approved school committee budget line items. Yes. Is there, is there a budget line item for school committee? <laughs> there is. Yes. In fact, yes. What should I do? So I, I know that our expenses are covered. I just didn't realize that we, were, we had a specific budget set aside for that. So, it, it's not a lot. <laughs> <laughs> But it is enough so that if you attend a workshop and you know you have travel expenses or you attend the MASC uh, conference on the Cape, you know you can get reimbursement for that. Right, and you know I, I guess the thought process behind it is this, right? MASC training is the eight-hour orientation is needed. Um, the M the MASC uh, conference that you know you, you had an opportunity to attend. I think uh, what. Uh, trainings and conferences of that nature give you is an opportunity to connect with so many other districts, to know what's going on, um, to learn from others' best practices, if you will. So it'll, it is only to help us do our job better, right? I was just sharing uh, with Dr. Kavanaugh and uh, Nancy today at the planning meeting. Um, that I had an opportunity to speak with the Framingham um, School Committee Chair the other day, and he was sharing some of the work that they are doing in their district. For instance, um, they are looking to get some help with regard to communication, right? And so you kind of get new ideas as you do all of this. So the thought process is, so MSE does do this conference every year. So it makes sense knowing that that's going to come up to plan for it, right? And we were thinking that perhaps it's a 500 to $600 per member expense for that particular conference. So knowing that that expense is coming up, we should earmark that. Now, if a particular member doesn't use it, we will have that pool of money remaining. But we could also use it perhaps for something like a diversity training or anything else that will help us do our job better. So just earmarking that would help was the thought. And I think there is a small amount to Dr. Kavanaugh's point that's earmarked. The, it, it, as an example, that the Youth Commission is looking into doing a diversity training, and his, it, the chair had approached me about to see if the school committee would be interested in perhaps doing a joint, it, participating with them. Uh, it, there would be some cost um, associated with that, but it, the money is in there also for things like covering um, the RMASC dues and stuff like that. Yeah, as well. I think it's an exception. I didn't realize that we, ha I thought it was part of another line item. I didn't realize it was called out specifically for school committee. I, do, I think the, my personal experience with the training, it, I would have been lost okay. without the new member training. Yeah. Even though it's mandated, it's mandated for a reason. And I think the, the um, you, for all the reasons you stated, going down to the conference where it's very important. So I'm not, I'm not questioning it. I just didn't realize that we had our own budget by then. I'm glad. I think it's important. Yeah, I think it's there because your membership in MASC falls under that line item. 
So can we vote on this as amended with just that MASC added in at the uh, in front of the orientation? Great. Eight hours of MASC, at mm -hmm. least eight hours of MASC orientation training. Any feedback on the checklist itself? What I'm meaning now is you have to be certain, it's not just familiarizing yourself, right? Don't you have to, or is that you an ethics training? That. If you have ethics training, you have to get certified. Right. Uh, and I, I, part of that so, uh, so the reason for that was, you know, if you look at the policy itself, it talks to providing all of that, right? The reason, uh, you know, we use the word familiarize is, you may read and sign up, but you may have some doubts, like what constitutes a deliberation? It's not specified in that very clearly. I think you know you have this doubt in your mind. So being able to do that and ask those questions. So this ties back to, um, if you look at the last paragraph, which talks about the chair and the superintendent will respond and clarify the practices around all of these. So as you familiarize yourself with all of this, if you have any questions, use that opportunity to ask them anything related to any of this, right? So as you familiarize yourself with it, right? I guess the whole point we were talking about with orientation is this is simply a beginning, right? There is no way you're going to learn all the intricacies and complexity of this job in a month, for sure. I mean, even over years, you're always learning. But there are some basic ones which you could start off with, which are so key at the get-go uh, that having that shot in the arm helps. But I'm certain we'll have to revisit all of this over the course of six months or so, right? And this is more of a form, correct? This is right. part of the policy. So if someone comes on board and they say, you know what, I would have loved to have known we had we had a school committee line item in the budget. Throw that in there, you know, yeah, whatever. Yeah. You can just add things as, as they come up. Ex so, exactly. So um, I like what you've got here. And if um, if the administrator, is, is this where it says something about meeting the key? It was in the policy, I guess. And it just said it was generalized. That's fine. Right. Thank um, you. The only thing that I picked up on, and this could be specific to me, but my FOB does not open the schools. It only opens the um, central office building. Yes. Well, That's good to know. Emails. Yeah, no, they. I think it, they all only open the central office. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll correct that. Um, and uh, you know, if you have any um, particular preference for understand practices rather than familiarize, we can change that no, no, verbiage. No, 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 no. Um, the one thing that I wanted to point to was um, the agenda item, adding an agenda item, mm. and creating a new subcommittee. Um, we talked about possibly adding that to the policy, but we held off saying that although we have a general practice, we haven't documented it. Mm. So we probably want to document it and bring it back. So Nancy and I are hoping that um, you know we can just get together, do a draft, and bring it back for your review as to when a new member comes in, you know, you're all gung-ho about have, having you know some things that you want to see happen or what have you. But then there is already a set pattern. There is a strategic plan in place. It's not something you can expect to just jump on right away or have a subcommittee right away. Um, so how do we set the expectations? And, and also on the agenda front, where are the boundaries? I, I think that's something Dr. Kavna brought up, that some of these things may not be in the purview of the school committee. So being able to have an honest conversation and say, this is really in my domain and you know not not necessarily something you put out there just like that so just some um, thoughts on how we can go about that mm -hmm. so would that be where I know we've had conversations about this in the past I know it's like a rhythm to the meetings that we have there are certain times that we have certain topics that come up every year as a new school committee member I don't feel that rhythm I don't know it this right. is my first time right and I had asked for a schedule yes. of what our rhythm is, and I ha hadn't seen it yet, but I know we're working on that, but is, could we have that on this checklist? I, I really hope so. My hope is that we can look at the calendar. The way I understand it is that there is a set calendar that's being followed from the last year, Correct. right? So whatever was on the agenda last year, you definitely want to go over and see, but then you may have some additions, right? So hopefully we'll, we'll have that. And, 
Um, you know, sometimes I think with the budget, I have seen the timelines change, right? So that can certainly affect change in the calendar. But we can have a typical, but you know, month, month one, month, month two, month. right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like what to expect General. in January, what yes. to expect in March. That yes. Kind of thing. Yeah. Like, for example, when do the school improvement plans come to us? Sure. Not, I know it's spring sometime. I think it's late spring, but things like that, just to kind of have it. Um, made available early on, so as a new school committee member, you're not looking for something in the wrong season. You know uh, absolutely, later. absolutely. Um, so you know, this is just a start, really. I think we'll continue to build on this orientation, right? Uh, but just having a checklist as a starting point and these two items, hopefully, they help. That's great, yeah. And then you know, as new members come in, I'm sure they'll have <laughs> ideas. That I think it may be something else to think about is get feedback from new members after three or four months of them being on board. What would you want changed in the orientation? Do you want something added? What was great? Something like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, this is great, great work, Mimi. The work that you've done over. Thank you. And to Dr. Kavner, too. We, we had a very good conversation. We did? All right. Well, then. Um, at this point, I would seek a motion, unless there's any further discussion on it, a motion to approve policy BIA Hopkinton School Committee, new school committee member orientation as amended. So moved. Motion by Jen, second by Amanda. All those in favor? Yes. yes. Aye. And that is so moved. Yes. Good job. Thank you. Good work. Then that uh, brings us up for our second opportunity for public comment. I do not see. Um, members of the public. So uh, in that case, we will move on to items by consensus. That's me. <laughs> as superintendent, I recommend that the school committee vote to approve the items by consensus as outlined in your agenda. So moved. Mina, second? Second. Motion by Mina, second by Jen. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. Aye. So moved. And I then would look for a motion to adjourn our meeting. So moved. Motion by Mina and a second. Second. Second by Amanda. All those in favor? Yes. yes. So then we are adjourned at 9 p.m. And our next meeting is right here next Thursday at 7 p.m. here in the high school library. Uh, and then we have another one following that in February. So thank you all uh, and have a good night. Thank you.